There we go. And we're started. Great. Um, and I will turn it over to Matt for the official welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, again, my name is Matt Twyman. I'm the current director of alumni relations at Tower Hill. And I just wanted to thank everyone this evening for joining us. Um, we're going to have a, a great uh, speaker this evening, Anisha Abraham, class of 1986. Um, just to kind of level everyone before we get started here, um, the format's going to be um, I'm going to try to do a, a Merv Griffin and, and ask a few questions um, of Anisha about her book. Um, and then obviously we will also be checking the chat to see if you have questions and we'll try to incorporate those as best we can. But if not, there will be a period at the end where we'll have an open session for questions. <laughs> um, and like, like uh, Melissa said, it, it will be recorded. So just be mindful of that. Um, but I am going to turn it back to uh, Melissa at this time because we're going to try something a little bit new as well. On this, That's this right. Podcast. So I will be making a polling question live to kind of sample our audience here <clears throat> and launching now. So please take um, about 20 seconds to answer these questions. They're pretty general. You does everyone see them on their screen? Okay. Um, that will help. Dr. Abraham know kind of who is in our audience and what folks would like to hear about. So again, for those that are just joining, we have a <clears throat> two poll questions that we have on the screen, which you should see. If you could just take a moment um, to answer those questions, that will kind of help us frame up the evening. Um, so it'd be great if you just go ahead and take a few moments to do that, and then we'll um, go ahead and get started. Mr. Twyman, while people fill that out, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for helping to organize this as our alumni director, and also to welcome Nisha uh, back to the Tower Hill family and to thank each of you alums, parents, um, colleagues uh, for joining this evening. Uh, this is a wonderful um, Tower Talk. And we have among us um, some very famous Tower Hill people, but uh, everyone should know we do have a former head of school, Mr. Tim Golding, in the audience here. Um, so welcome back, Tim. Thanks for joining us. And again, Matt, well, thank you. And, and Nisha, thank you for joining. Participated and they consumed With that, I think I will close the poll. And Matt, do you want to get us started before we uh, reveal the results? Sure. <coughs> Go ahead and take this off my stream, but... Um, before we get started, I did, um, as, I, as I look at on the screen, I see quite a few uh, classmates of Anisha's from the class of 1986. Um, and unfortunately, one of the members I don't see on there um, is that of Dwayne Hicks. And you might not be aware, but Dwayne, like I said, was a class of 1986, and he passed away this past weekend. Um, as you know, Tower Hill is a very small knit community very close, our classes tend to be close. Um, I was very close friends with Dwayne. Uh, we rode together, he gave me a ride um, when I couldn't get to school, which was great. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment to kind of recognize um, Dwayne and let all those know that we're thinking about him and that um, our thoughts are with him and his family um, kind of during this time. But as we kind of go ahead and, and move forward with this evening, I, I did want to take a moment to formally kind of read the bio and read a little bit and tell you a little bit about um, our very own Dr. Anisha Abraham. Um, so Anisha is a board certified pediatrician and adolescent health specialist with 25 years of global experience. Um, Anisha treats and counsels young people with a variety of issues, including social media usage, drug use, and stress. As a recognized educator, Anisha provides training on adolescents' health and wellness to faculty, teens, and parents. Um, Anisha's clinical and research work combined with her experience with cultures and transition is the basis for her passion and interest in making the lives of global teens better. Um, Anisha completed her medical degree at Boston University, her pediatric residency at Walter Reed Hospital, a fellowship in adolescent medicine at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC, um, and a master's in public health at George Washington University. Um, during her career, Anisha has served in various roles including uh, Chief of Adolescent Medicine, um, a Lieutenant Colonel um, in the U.S. Army, and Medical Director of a school-based clinic. <clears throat> um, she has also been on the faculty uh, um, at the University of Amsterdam, Chinese University of Hong Kong, 
in Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. And currently, um, her book, which I have here, which we're gonna be discussing this evening, um, the book is called Raising Global Teens, A Practical Handbook for Parenting in the 21st Century, was an Amazon number one new release in teen health, um, the bestseller in Amazon US, UK, and Germany. So everyone, please uh, welcome, if you will, uh, Dr. Anisha Abraham. So um, Anisha, I think before we get started to kind of help level set us if we can, um, Melissa, do you want to share kind of the, the poll results? Because that'll give us an idea. Let's get a drum roll. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can everyone see that? Sure. So maybe just take us through quickly, Melissa, if you can. Sure thing. Let me see if I can expand this out. I don't know if I can. I guess I'll just have to scroll. Um, so it appears that we have a pretty even split between um, the 10 to 13 year age group and the 14 to 17 year age group. Um, that tends to be where most of our folks are distributed. And as far as biggest issues, screen time and social media. Um, yeah. And with that. Okay, great. Yes, uh, well, probably, I, I think Dr. Abraham plans to t touch on several of these anyway, right? So. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I'm going to kind of ask it. Uh, one of the, the questions I had, Anisha, was um, kind of what motivated you to write this book? Um, you know, why now? Like, what, what was kind of your thought process and kind of what, what went into that? Right. Well, I want to just start by saying thank you to uh, Tower Hill Advancement Office, Matt Twyman, Bessie Spears for organizing this event. Thank you to all of you. It's good to see so many familiar faces, particularly from my class um, and, of course, uh, you know, uh, colleagues as well. Um, but it's wonderful to see so many of you. And thank you for taking time to be on this, what I hope is a very interactive discussion today. Um, coming back to your question, Matt, um, why did I write this book and why this book now? Um, I'll just say that the world has become an inter, it's increasingly become a global mobilized world. Yeah. There's more and more young people that grew up as I did um, with more than one culture. Um, my parents were immigrants from India and there's more young people that have parents that were immigrants or immigrants themselves have moved from place to place, have moved from country to country, have parents from different backgrounds and um, more than that, maybe exposed to multiple cultures on a daily basis, both physically and virtually. And with that, um, with kids becoming more multicultural or cross-cultural, there's some wonderful benefits in terms of tolerance and adaptability and worldview, but there's some challenges, um, particularly when it comes to identity and belonging. And adolescence is such an important time in terms of figuring out your identity as you become an adult, both physically, sexually, but also in terms of cultural identity. So um, this book is really um, a book to go through all of these hot issues that young people are dealing with right now, particularly with the lens of, again, having this cross-cultural globalized world. Sure. So you, you kind of, you know, touched on something which kind of is the big elephant that's in the room right now. It's kind of the COVID-19 and kind of what, you know, we're all experiencing right now. And obviously that's kind of had an effect on everyone you know, around the world. Um, you know, if you look at from an economic stress, you know, family stress, I just think about prior to us being in person, everyone like in my household, all five of us working from home. Mm -hmm. So you have copious time with one another. Um, you know, how can pa parents kind of best support their global teens as we kind of manage all these stress factors or stress things that are going on right now? Um, how, how do we go about kind of doing that? Um, and that I think you're bringing up a really important question and one that I know a lot of young people are struggling with and a lot of parents are struggling with as well. And um, the COVID pandemic has certainly increased the number of young people that are feeling really uncertain about the future, whether or not schools are going to stay open. My own kids in Washington, D.C. are currently online. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen. They certainly um, may feel isolated in terms of being able to connect with peers in the same way. A lot of them are not doing extracurricular activities or sports in the same way certainly not able to travel or see family members. So there's a lot I think that's happening with that. Um, what we do know about adults is that the incidence of depression has tripled and anxiety has quadrupled in the United States. And that has certainly also trickled down to kids and more and more kids are becoming uh, stressed, anxious, or coming in and saying those things. And so I think it's really important for us as adults, as educators, as caregivers, to be aware of these issues. And I guess maybe two quick thoughts about this. 
Um, the first is, um, and something I talk about over and over again in the book, is the importance of having connections with kids. Because connections, particularly with parents, is so protective against all of these other issues that we think about that come with the pandemic. And um, having conversations is a really great way to make those connections. And we can maybe talk more about how do you have conversations with kids, because sometimes that can be really hard, particularly teenagers that are with their friends all the time, but certainly having times to have regular conversations and being aware of how your kids are. I, mean, I think routine and structure also really helps. I'm um, thinking about having some downtime um, ways to build in what I call um, your self-help um, or um, anti-stress toolkits or ways right. that you as parents can handle stress. These are other things as well. Um, so those are some quick thoughts, but again, we know the pandemic is affecting everyone. Right, so you bring up two things. One, communication, which I'll come back to, but, but two, you were talking about kind of distractions, things along those lines. I have three children, two are 13, one's, one's 11, almost a teen. And one of the things I struggle with kind of going on that pandemic is screen time. Yeah. And how do you kind of balance yeah. that? And I'm sure it's, and I don't want to be that dad, but by the same token. so. Can you talk a little bit about that, how we as parents can maybe manage that? Because I think that's that's big given what's going on right now. Absolutely, and I see from our poll that it's certainly an issue that parents on this call are struggling with, or adults are struggling with. And it, it's again, something that I think many parents that I'm working with, and certainly as a parent myself, I also, you know, I'm, I'm certainly really wondering what's the right balance. So I'll say um, this, which is that there's a lot of benefits to screen time. Um, and I certainly talk about this again in the book that um, the benefits of course for screen time um, is it's a very important way for kids to connect with other young people right now. And we certainly know this from across the globe that young people more and more are using phones or computers as ways to have conversations and connect with friends or family members or others. And they will tell you that it's a really important way for them to have that connection. Um, so that's certainly something to think about. Obviously we're using screens a lot for education um, certainly, it's helpful for kids that might be in kind of minorities to connect with other groups. Um, you know, if there's a part of a group that they may not be able to see otherwise, there's some benefit again for using screens. But there can also be challenges. You know, sometimes kids are on all the time. They're not getting outdoors. They're not having downtime. It's affecting their sleep. And certainly, we know with social media, which again, I think is, can have a lot of benefit, there can be a downside. Kids that tend to constantly look at themselves and compare themselves or need frequent likes those kids are at slightly higher um, uh, likelihood of having body image and eating disorder related issues. And so there can be a downside to it. So my quick thought in terms of screen time, because we could talk the entire time about it, is what I call the three C's. Um, and the first C stands for context, the second C stands for child, and the third C stands for community. So know the context of what your child is engaging in when it comes to screen time. Um, I have a lot of tolerance for Khan Academy, for example. If my kids are gonna do Khan Academy, I'll let them do it for hours. Um, but if it's a really violent video game where people are cutting their heads off, then I'm gonna probably see if I can try to cut that down. And again, more and more, we don't talk about how many hours you need to be on screen time. We as adults and care caregivers need to be those coaches that help them to navigate it. So again, context. The second is know your child. Some kids are able to disengage from the screens much more easily than others. I have two boys. One, you tell him, you can tell him like five minutes, you need to stop. He's able to get off. The second one is a lot harder. And for some children, you probably are going to nod your head. It's like cocaine. They can't stop. They need it. They need it. They kind of keep going back to it. If you have a child that has a hard time disengaging from their phone or their computers or other forms of screens, and some kids also have ADHD or you know, issues related to impulse control, those are kids that need a lot more structure and support in terms of disengaging. And so you as the parent ultimately have that ability to do it, whether again, it's taking their devices outside of the room to recharge them, giving them a little bit more limited time, giving them the ability to do some other to their schedule, but we need to create that framework. And then the very last issue is community. So is your child on the screen so much that they're losing the bigger community? Are they no longer talking to you as a family a member or you know, are they no longer engaging in the same ways? Um, we don't talk about internet addiction as much as we now talk about something called problematic internet media use or PMU. And um, some of the signs of that is if your child is lying about their use, they're constantly on, that's their primary way of stimulation. So being aware of what your child is like and if they're potentially at risk for what I talk about, some of those red flags with PMU is important. But otherwise, thinking about us as coaches, thinking about contracts, um, 
Common Sense Media is a wonderful resource for parents to do a media contract, for example. These are some ideas in terms of how to navigate screen time. Sure, so, so that kind of leads to another big one. I said I was gonna come back to you, communication. Um, <laughs> I think all parents, so I'll, I'll speak for self, um, you know, the, the struggle with communication and how do you, you effectively communicate um, with your teens? And I know each child's a little bit different, but, you know, and it came up in the poll. Can you talk a little bit about communication, maybe effective ways, how we go about doing it, things along those lines? Absolutely. I think um, communication is really important and coming back um, to the issues related to conversations. One of the biggest questions I get from parents is, how do we teens right now. They don't want to talk to me. They go up into their rooms. They're really just with their friends. They're on their screens. I have all these things I want to chat about. They don't want to talk about it. So I, again, a couple of tips. Um, one tip, um, and I know Dr. White would agree with me as an adolescent physician, is always talk about what their friends are doing as a way to talk about what's happening in their lives. Most kids aren't going to just tell you, I'm stressed, I'm depressed, I'm suicidal, you know, whatever is happening, but talk about what's happening to their peer group. You know, how, do you know anyone else that's feeling stressed or down or just depressed or something along those lines? That's a great way to segue into, and how are you doing? Can we check in with you? So talk about peer group. And of course, we can use that for anything. You can talk about vaping, you can talk about, you know, sexual health related issues. It's a great way to start those tougher conversations. Um, the other tip I have is try not to look them in your in their eyes when you're having those tough conversations. Um, as you can remember from maybe your own parents, it's really intimidating when you're looking them straight in the eye. So as a parent or as an adult, try to do things in parallel. When you're walking with them, when you're biking with them, when you're driving them to something, try to to do it. And for my own kids, sometimes when I'm putting them to bed and it's dark, that's the time I get the juiciest conversations because I'm not looking in their eyes and they're kind of sleeping. Then I slip in all the questions. So think about some of those ways to start conversations. And then my final tip, and I have to say I'm guilty of this, is that my kids say, mom, sometimes you go on and on and on. And our kids whose brains are still developing are not able to follow this very kind of long kind of exposition that we have as parents and explanations and all kinds of things. They just don't get it. So the, the rule that I um, put in my book that um, is from Rosalind Wiseman that wrote Mean Girls and a lot of other wonderful things is what I call the 50% rule. Say half of what you really want to say, because many times our kids are not following what we continue to keep doing. So again, think about it, try to be concise. I think our kids will really respect us for it. So, so that's great, great advice. Thank you for that. 50% um, rule I like. I think there are <laughs> that I want to have like zero conversation. <laughs> being honest and that's that's the about sex um particularly as it relates to teens i have a young daughter so tell us a little bit about like if you're a parent um how do, how do you kind of have that conversation what kind of makes it maybe a little bit easier for us um being right. honest. <laughs> so i'm going to just have people raise their hand for a moment um but how many of you have actually talked to your kids about sex all right some folks are <laughs> and then how many of you found it really awkward to have that conversation. Okay. Um, and it's funny uh, that I certainly ask a lot of young people about this. And some of them do have conversations. Many of them don't have conversations. Obviously, there's some cultural barriers as well. Um, certainly in my time in Netherlands, that was a much more open um, area of conversation. My time in Hong Kong, this was an area that was taboo, a stigma, most people weren't talking about it. And I've also had some really funny experiences related to this. Um, one of my teen patients said, you know, Dr. Abraham, my parents said, I'm just not allowed to have sex until I get into a good university. Um, so, you know, there's certainly parents that say this. Um, and one of my other teen patients said, you know, Dr. Abraham was, was a um, young person in London, I was on my way to a soccer match and my dad pulled me over and he said, we're going to talk about the birds and the bees now. And this little boy said, all I could think about is that I was going to be late for my soccer match. So again, sometimes the timing is also really important. And I think we are well intentioned as parents, but we need to figure out how to start having those conversations and to start them early. And the final other story I just want to impart to all of you is that um, we, we really need to figure out how to make this something that's a little bit easier. I talk about in the book how when we first moved to Amsterdam, Netherlands, there's a museum called the Nemo Museum. It's a science museum. And I went to the top floor um, and it turned out it was an exhibit. It was all about the adolescent. And I, as a physician working with young people, was really excited. But then I was actually really amazed because it was talking about the brain and all the changes in the body. 
But then there was a section which was all about sex. And when you went there, they had um, little mannequins that were doing French kissing. I'm like, wow, that's really open. And then there was a whole section where there was various positions of lovemaking and contraception. I said, this is the Children's Science Museum. It's incredible how open that the Dutch are about this conversation. And so what we also know is that the data supports that Dutch youth have the lowest rates of things like teen pregnancy and all these other issues. So my point being that culturally, they're much more open about it. Culturally, many of us are having a lot of challenges with that. And I think, again, sometimes we see that. My quick thoughts on this is that we need to start these conversations early. In the Netherlands, they start sexual education by the time kids are four years of age, and then they ramp it up. It's developmentally appropriate. We talk about things like good and bad touch. And they start to talk about other issues. For any of you that have kids that have had phones, you need to start talking about things like the fact that they may be getting requests for sexting um, or that they're getting a pressure to do something related to sexting. And studies have shown nearly 60% of young teenagers have received a sext request, um, have seen a sext, um, or maybe have sent one. So being aware of that, and that's again a sexual message related to text messaging is really important. A lot of young boys in particular um, are viewing pornography um, or may see it inadvertently. So having conversations with young boys and girls about this are important. So any kid that's handed a phone or a screen, you need to start having these conversations. In the book, I also talk about it by age. And certainly as you get to teenagers, talking about things like um, consent is really important. And then as we know that binge drinking becomes very, it increases as you go, as you get older and certainly as you go off to university, the whole issue of how alcohol lowers your ability to um, have consent and puts you at higher risk for being a perpetrator or a victim of sexual assault. So that's just a tidbit of what we should be talking about. But start early, use teachable moments when you watch a movie, when you're out seeing a billboard or something like that, use anatomical parts. And you don't need to do it all at one time, but just starting to again plant that seed for them to come back to you. I don't know, Matt, I know this is awkward and you're shaking your head and it's probably really tough to do, but um, I hope that parents and folks on this call realize this is a topic that's awkward, it's tough, but the more you can start to have those conversations, your kids are gonna come back to you. Great, well, thank you. So, <laughs> no, I think that's very good. Um, I, I just wanna encourage people, if you have questions, type them into the chat. If there's things you want me to follow up on, or maybe we even throw it to you to follow up on, please do so. Um, change gear a little bit. You know, at, at an independent school, um, luckily I have the ability, Bessie has given me the opportunity to have wear several different hats. One of those hats I wear is as a coach. Um, and, and one of the things I see, it, it manifests itself when I'm, I'm coaching. I, I coach hurdles, a very technical event. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's the fear that I see of a lot of students to fail. And, and one of the things about running hurdles and, and anything in general is, you know what you need to do, you know where you need to improve if you, if you go to failure, if, if you kind of push yourself outside your comfort zone so you can fail, and then you can improve upon that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel particularly with Tower Hill students, who are very structured about success and, and meeting goals and things along the lines, there's, a, there's a, what I would call almost an unhealthy fear about failing. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. And I, I love the metaphor of hurdles and again, being afraid to sometimes fall down. But I, what I tell young people and I also tell parents that the biggest predictor of success in life is not getting a perfect CV or getting into the top Ivy League university um, or even having a perfect job, but it's the ability to get back up on your feet after you've experienced a failure. And I call that the concept of having bounce, you know, bouncing back up. And um, resilience, grit, bounce, these things are not things that kids are inherently born with. These are things that we can help build them. And certainly the pandemic is a wonderful opportunity because there's a lot of disappointment and challenge right now um, to help kids to start to think about having that bounce. Um, the other thing I'm gonna mention is that we need to allow kids to experience failure while they're still with us because what I see when I work in university settings is that kids are coming in because their lives, um, many times parents or the people around them have moved away those obstacles and made things easy and made sure that, that things can happen. Um, and when they get off to university, they experience their first bad grade, their first breakup or some other disappointment and they fall apart because they're not used to experiencing those failures before. So my biggest advice is we need to sometimes make it uncomfortable for kids, as tough as that sounds as parents, you know, they leave their book bag at home and now they don't have it at school. You know, maybe we don't need to be driving it all the way in. All these little things that we sometimes do to clear away those obstacles, we need to make it a little bit more uncomfortable for them so they can learn from these experiences before they become adults and then they're not able to. Sure, great, okay, thank you. 
Um, I don't see anything in the chat, but so moving. But again, if anyone has any questions, um, put it in the chat, or um, I'll be more than willing to kind of take those questions as well. Um, the one thing, I mean, I I, I read um, a little bit of your book, and you, you share some of your 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 own experience, some of the anecdotes I see in there, or, or your own experiences. Can you, you want to talk a little bit about that, or maybe one that was kind of special that that led to a particular chapter in the book? Um, oh boy, uh, there's I think lots of experiences um, that I talk about. One of that probably I think relates um, to Tower Hill is that um, growing up, um, I grew up in an Indian American household, and um, there was a lot in terms of family always being around. Um, certainly, people always cooking. Food was really a very important part of my family. Um, being able to have that um, Indian identity was really important to me. And um, at the time when I went to Tower Hill, I believe I was the first Indian American to graduate from, from Tower Hill. So there was a lot of people that I felt looked like me. And it wasn't until later on um, in university that I met other people um, that were Indian American and had kind of that similar experience. And I bring this up because of course, I, I'm so happy to know that there's so much more diversity at the school. When I walk there, I'm always amazed when I come back to school to see I know, how that's changed. But I still think that um, I bring up this story because there is a lot that we as parents still need to think about in terms of these issues related to identity and belonging. And one of the concepts I talk about a lot is that we all have a story. Um, my parents that were other on um, the call right now, you know, they came as immigrants. They had an arranged marriage. They had their own story. My father-in-law, my, my husband is German. Um, they grew up during World War II and this entire experience of war. We all have stories and we need to share those stories as adults. Um, but we certainly need to get kids to also talk about their own stories about identity and ensuring that they feel connected, they know their heritage, but they also feel connected to the community around them. Sure. So, so one question that came in kind of relates to this, you were talking about uh, recognizing di differences. One of the questions I'm reading here says, um, with all the openness about different genders, how is it best to talk about these issues? So kind of related. All right, someone has a hot question there. Um, I think this is really an important question. And again, this is a tough one for many people. And I'm very aware that we all have our own moral, religious, cultural values when it comes to gender identity and sexual identity. But the short answer is that um, most young people by the time that they're 10 or 11 or 12 have, a, have some sense um, who they're attracted to and what their um, sexual or gender identity may be like. They may not act on it. They may take a long time. And I've certainly been in communities um, in the South the United States, uh, in Asia and other places where you're not allowed to. There's a lot of barriers in, the, in terms of being able to talk about these issues. And so I think the short answer is that we as parents need to be open and aware that kids are going through adolescence and are starting to have some sense of these issues. And even if they aren't, there are other friends of theirs or peers that are going through these issues. Most young people that I talk to can tell me that they know somebody else that's gay or lesbian or is identified as transgendered. So creating a culture of um, at least having young people being tolerant about these issues is really important. And certainly as parents, knowing that we want to love and support our kids as much as possible, um, even though sometimes we may not necessarily understand what they're going through and having conversations about that. And if we can't do that, making sure that we're, ta we're taking them to someone like a healthcare provider that can help start those conversations. So I hope I've answered that, but it's creating a kind of a culture of openness and tolerance across the board. Okay, and, and kind of, it might be in that, that same vein when I think about kind of body image and how, huh. Um, um, teens struggle with body image and, and I used to think that was kind of you know mostly on the female side but as I got into college I realized that was also a very big male image too um, particularly as I, I look at you know there's some adolescents that <laughs> have matured greatly and some that have not um, and, and again going back to the track arena those that tend to be performing very well have matured so their muscles are there and things along those lines can you talk a little bit about body image and, and how do we kind of help teens with that Right. Um, I, I think body image is a really important issue and there's so much pressure that kids are experiencing from what they're seeing through social media, what they're seeing in terms of advertisements and media, much less their peers and maybe what they're getting from family members and from themselves in terms of looking or appearing a certain way. And again, as you mentioned, it's not just a female thing, but it's certainly also a male thing. And I've had a share of young men that again, have struggled with these issues, have you know, sometimes even been admitted for things like anorexia and, and bulimia. 
So I think being aware of this is really important. Um, what I can also say from a physiological standpoint is that a lot of girls, when they go through puberty, they increase their body fat content. So suddenly they may have been really thin and all of a sudden they're developing hips and they're developing breasts and they're developing you know, body parts and, and changing, which can be very disconcerting for them. Um, boys, on the other hand, tend to increase muscle mass when girls are increasing um, body fat, but some boys may not also feel like they're going through muscle mass. And of course, there's also differences in terms of when these things happen. So my point in all of this is that we need to be very aware of these issues. We need to be talking to kids. One of the questions that we use a lot when we're talking to kids is, when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see and how do you feel about it? And I've had kids that have said all kinds of things, like Dr. Abraham, I have a big nose, but everyone in my family has a big nose. I'm okay with that. But then I've also had kids that say, Dr. Abraham, I think I'm really ugly and I'm really fat and I'm really unhappy with myself. And so that to me, and it's okay to have a bad hair day and sometimes not feel good about yourself as a teenager. But if you're constantly feeling down about yourself, to me, that's a big red flag that that's a young person that needs a lot more support. And if you can do that early on, it certainly is so helpful in terms of all the other things that can happen. So hopefully that's a short answer, but going back to strengths, um, is something else that I would really talk about, which is how do you change the focus from what's on the outside to what's on the inside? And a lot of what we do when we're working with young people is what is it that's unique and wonderful about them and how do we build that? Because that's a great way to start to think about building self-esteem and decreasing issues related to body image. Sure. So I'm going to take a few questions that we have from the chat. So it's going to jump around a little bit, but um one question that, that came up, and I think it's, it's relevant um, given all that's going on now, is can you share, Anisha, um, some guidance about helping our children navigate the upcoming election? The oh. stress that comes with it, particularly when they are passionate about an issue, and how to ne uh, negotiate, um, negotiate conversations with their classmates? Definitely a good question. Oh, boy. Um, a good hot topic, and I certainly will open it up to others and how they would do it. And it's also really interesting because my own kids, we were living in Amsterdam, we just moved back to Washington, D.C. Um, just a few weeks ago, and we we're just kind of in the hotbed of all kinds of political related issues. And my kids are quite politically savvy and are asking lots of questions. And so how do we negotiate this? I think it's how we negotiate anything else that's happening. We do, at the end of the day, um, as, as um, parents, want our kids to be aware Obviously, um, you want to be appropriate in terms of their age, but you want them to be aware of what's happening in the world and certainly understanding um, choices and the whole idea of an election and democracy and the power of voting. Those, I think, are really important concepts. Um, also, having some understanding of some of the basic issues that are perhaps at stake um, during the election and maybe taking the time, again, based on their age, to view things with them, talk about um, your own views and why you have those views. You as a parent may have different views than your child. And so being able to be aware of that and having those discussions, I think are a really great foundation for kids to think about you know, what's important. I think the final thing you brought up, which is tough, um, is what do you do when other kids in class have different views? And I think, again, this comes back to how do we create tolerance um, within our own community, much less how do we do that in the country? And so how do we create that microcosm by at least being aware of what other um, viewpoints are and being able to have that discussion and not shutting um, folks off would be my quick thought. Again, I know that's hard sometimes. Sure. So I'm going to keep going to the live chat here. I have another question, again, kind of relevant to what's going on. Um, it's, it's about COVID as it relates to do you have any suggestions on how to encourage our kids to connect with one another when they're behind masks and they're supposed to distance themselves, especially with the older, um, with colder weather setting in? Any suggestions about that? Oh gosh, that's a tough one. I'm sure that's one also the school is struggling with um, a bit. And um, I will just say that my own kids have just moved to this country and are online in school. So even getting friends now, it's been really tough for them. And certainly walking around and having masks is another layer of challenge. Um, I think it goes back to what are those things that they're interested in and building on that. So, um, you know, one of my kids has now joined the debate team. And for him, that's a really great way, virtually at least, to be able to connect to other people um, and be able to have something in common. So going back to the things that they do enjoy and using that as a way of building from that is, is really helpful. I do think that masks are really hard. Um, it's hard to know how people are thinking or feeling. It does block that level of emotion. It's hard to get around that. 
Um, but I think, um, again, can we just build on the things that they are doing that they enjoy, whether they are something that's virtual or something that's in place, as much of the sports activities that, as you can get into their life, I think would also be really great. So that's my quick answer on that. Sure. So now kind of another question, again, kind of related to COVID coming from one of your former classmates, Dave Blickenstaff. Hey, Dave. Uh, <laughs> uh, his question is, I think it is a good one, is, um, Anisha, uh, what do you think about um, the impact of the lockdown on teens' development? Um, the, a neighbor of mine called uh, the period uh, arrested development. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. Kind of what are your thoughts about that? Because um, I think, again, it's kind of a very relevant topic with, yep. with the impact of, of lockdown. David, thank you for bringing that question up. It's something that I really worry about. Um, I think the concern is, do we, are we now creating a generation of young kids that are somehow stunted both physically and um, mentally? Are we creating you know, some period of time where they're arrested? And in some ways, this is a very unusual time, right? Kids are online a lot more. They're not interacting. They're not going out doing these usual things or even trying to experiment, do all the other things that are a normal part of adolescent development. And so um, I do really worry, and I do hope that this is a short enough time that we can kind of move on. So how do we kind of handle that, I guess, is the other question. And this is where I say it's coming back to those connections, those conversations, checking in with your kids on a very regular basis as to how they're feeling. And these can, things can change very quickly from day to day. So continually checking in. And again, a lot of teens, particularly teen boys, they tend to pull away. They're not going to be chatty and they're not going to tell you what's going on. They're going as part of development, not talk to you. So you've got to start to keep working in ways to be with them and to check in, ask them about the peer group and be aware of how they're doing kind of mentally. Um, certainly physically, I also worry, and I just saw an article that the incidence of obesity, something that I've worked on a lot as a, a researcher and as a healthcare provider is going up. And we know that, I mean, kids are just not able to do the usual sports and they're online a lot more. So as parents, we've got to figure out how to build that back into their lives and certainly um, getting them to get outdoors. And that may mean you as adults need to model that. So whether you have to go out and do a walk or a hike or a bike or get a dog, which many people have done just to get kids to be active, you've got to be also a little bit more creative in these things. But we do now know that kids are not physically active in the same ways that they have. So I, I hear you speaking to me. I get it. Get rid of I'm my not parents. talking to you personally, but <laughs> any, any parent. <laughs> got it. Uh, I think that's a good point. So, and you, you kind of answered this question too that came in is, you know, there's a lot of unanswerable questions that are out there. Um, and I think as, you know, as parents, we probably struggle with that. But the question is, how should we ease the anxiety of the children, um, as, again, around COVID and some of those questions that we can't answer for them because we don't know? Right. Um, you know, how do we address uncertainty? Um, and I think one very humanizing thing is to talk to kids about the fact that you also are going through these experiences and you're also unsure as an adult. Um, again, these are for probably your middle to older adolescents um, simply expressing, you know, for parents and for adults, this is also a tough time and we also aren't quite sure, but we're going to kind of figure this out together and we're going to be there to support you and to talk to you and to figure out how we can be creative and create and making new milestones because we're not able to have the milestones that we thought we could have, the celebrations that we thought. So I think, you know, that would be my, my short answer to some of that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So questions keep coming in. Please um, keep sending them. I, I can read, but... Um, another question that they came up is, um, how do we help our children cope with friending, unfriending, and social media? Um, that's kind of their question. Friending and unfriending in social media and, and in person, I guess. Um, you, know, um, you know, adolescence is a really important time for kids to pull away from parents and to spend a lot more time with peer group. And then we also know even within adolescence, there's some differences. So kids that are early to middle adolescence or are going to perhaps be more involved in things like cliques. And as they get older, that is less of an issue and they are gonna maybe have more friendships and relationships, but the click issue is probably less of a concern. I think the question again has to do with friending and unfriending either virtually or physically and how we can make sure that our kids have um, positive, enduring uh, friendships and not ones that they can simply remove because you can just take it away with a click. And so I think going back to creating and, and encouraging them to create friendships that are built on kind of positive values, friends that 
um, believe in them and, and are, um, are good to them and are not putting them down, are not belittling them, are not criticizing them. And sometimes it's tough because there's peer pressure. They want to be popular. They want to be like everyone else. And so I think as parents, being aware of that, having conversations, starting to tell them to go back to what it is that, you know, are what's positive about friendships and, and so on. We also can't meddle too much because if you sit there and tell kids, you know, who their friends are going to be, they're going to do exactly the opposite. So right. part of this is also allowing them um, to make some of these autonomous decisions and learn from those experiences and have those discussions. Um, but I think making sure that kids choose friends based on positive things, um, I think is important. So in that same vein of friends, this came up, um, this question is, um, um, how do we support our kids' um, social needs during the pandemic, yet we're walking a fine line when they're invited to social gatherings? So this is definitely, I think, in uh. <laughs> the pandemic, one uh. we all have faced, mom and dad, I want to go, yeah, we've got the pandemic, talk a little bit about that and how do we kind of navigate and manage that? You know, that's, it's so tough because, you know, this is a time kids want to be with other kids, right? This is so important is to be with their friends and connect and to either do sports or go to parties. I mean, this is such an important part of their development and it's an important part of their life. And so as David had mentioned, are we arresting that um, in some ways the pandemic? Uh, the short answer is yes, but we also need to really realize that for us to be able to go back to normal, for schools to be able to stay open for long periods of time and everything else to reopen, we also need to impart to them what their responsibility is to the community. And before we started this call, we were talking about how Delaware has now started to have some certain hot zones and the numbers of COVID have increased. And one of those hot zones is university campuses, where a lot of young adults um, are, again, mingling with each other and are not always thinking about the consequences. Um, and part of adolescence, because of how the brain is developing, is that they're not always thinking about consequences or thinking a lot about trying and testing and pleasure and reward. So coming back to the question, we as parents need to give them some framework about how important it is for them at this time to be safe, mass, social distancing, probably not going to a lot of these uh, gatherings where they could potentially get someone else sick or they could get sick and bring it back to someone else that's immunocompromised potentially bring it back to the school and cause the school to not be able to kind of work in the same ways. So I think it's a lot of education and um, discussions about responsibility, knowing that it's hard sometimes for kids to really understand that because they're not always thinking about consequences. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. This is another question from the chat. It says, um, Anisha, can you make suggestions for how to incur, no, I'm sorry, missed it. What criteria should one consider when selecting a healthcare provider like a psychologist for your team? How can you help ensure a good connection and experience? I think that's kind of an important one. You know, that's a really important question. And I think that um, it's really, it's useful to have some sense of who your child may connect with. Um, some young people do better if they have a male provider versus a female provider. Um, certainly, I think um, all providers are trying to be culturally sensitive, but you know, sometimes kids can have connections also based on you know, social cu cultural backgrounds and, and, and those types of things. Um, I think it's very helpful um, to get word of mouth. Sometimes you may know from the school or other parents, who are providers that connect better and do a better job with young people. As an adolescent medicine physician, I always encourage people to go to places where they have adolescent clinics. Um, and I certainly know there's a few places in Delaware and, and, and Pennsylvania um, that have them because those are doctors that are trained to work with teenagers. So those of you that have teens that have maybe some more complicated issues or you just want someone that can really understand teenagers, that's another thought just for your primary care provider. But I think um, also just having them meet that provider even once and just getting a sense. A lot of providers are using telemedicine right now, so that may make it easier. Um, so it's a combination of word of mouth, um, knowing your child's needs, and maybe even having that initial visit, making sure that they have some training or understanding of how to work with teenagers. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, one, one question, it's kind of related to that, it, and then, well, not really, but it's teens in general, there's a lot of moodiness, uh, yeah. a lot of, I'll say, ups and downs. Um, can you speak to that in terms of how, does, how do we kind of navigate that as parents? What's kind of maybe the best way 
for, for handling that. All right, so raise your hands. How many of you have dealt with teens and moodiness? <laughs> All right, probably <laughs> waving your hands. Um, you know, it's a really, uh, it's a very normal part of teen development. Um, again, it's a really tough part for parents, but um, I have an entire chapter in the book that talks about the teen brain and the fact that um, there's a lot of lability that's going on um, with that. Um, and certainly hormones can also uh, very much affect um, feeling really happy one moment and feeling really down the next moment and kind of vacillating in between. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, the connections that are being made, the synapses and all of um, those connections and the pruning, which has to do with cutting back of certain connections as well, that can also influence mood and lability of mood and this up and down feeling. So when you have a child that is snapping at you, is um, you know not wanting to talk to you, is pleasant one moment and not the next, I do think it's important to remember that it's really not about you, it's about their brain and it's a work in progress. So go back to the fact that this is just a fundamental part of development and how can we support them? Um, I think uh, is important. I, I read a great article in the New York Times and it was something that stuck with me. And it said that all teenagers just want us to be like house plants, that we just, they just want us to be in the corner of the room and act like a plant and not say anything, but just know that we're there. So when they're really moody and they're doing that roller coaster, just act like a plant. <laughs> okay, plant, got it. Fair <laughs> Um, I'm going to go a little bit off script here and ask one of my former classmates, um, Renee Berry, if you want to ask your question. Yes, Renee, I'm sorry. Um, unmute yourself because you have a part in that question that I might need you to explain. But if you want to go ahead, Renee, and ask your, your question. Hi, Anisha. Hi, how are how you? How are you? Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> Evening, Dobbs. <laughs> Um, I just had a question about a friend of mine in California. Mm -hmm. it, they tend to have a little bit more um, Eastern philosophy, med philosophical medicine there. She had um, taken her daughter for some EMDR uh, treatment for stress and anxiety and was just really raving about it because her daughter had been in talk therapy for quite some time. And she said it just wasn't taking her anywhere fast enough. So I didn't know what your thoughts or if you had any experience with that treatment and, and maybe you can explain to everybody what that means. Um, I've done, you know, minor research on it and it, it is pretty interesting. Um, Renee, maybe just explain to everyone what you think EMDR is, what it stands for. So it's the rapid eye movement that they've used tradition or not traditionally, they have used it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the military have used it for mm -hmm. um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And it tends to be a, a shortened period of time. Mm -hmm. And the way my friend explained it to me is the, and maybe this is all wrong, but the younger you are, obviously the shorter amount of stress, anxiety, emotional experiences you've had. So it's sort of easier to dive in and, and get to it quicker than someone maybe our age. Right. No, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I personally don't have a lot of experience with EMDR. And I'll just say that there are lots of different modalities and alternative treatments that are out there. Um, and I think it's really important to be aware that there's a lot of ways that we can treat one issue. And I'm a huge supporter of knowing that traditional medicine is one avenue. My family's from India, so there's, you know, Ayurvedic, there's a lot of different things that are out there that have also been happening for years. Um, it's sometimes also hard to know what the data and the research is behind it. So as um, a physician that's traditionally trained, we always say, well, what does the data show and what's out there and can you really prove this to us? So I'm not familiar with the data for EMDR. I do know that people have used it and have been very happy with it. I think it's important if you're choosing any provider that's again, a little alternative or different, that they have a good reputation, that you know, they're solidly trained, that they can tell you, you know, what are the benefits and why they're doing it and all of that. Um, and certainly you know, to be open to the fact that you know, to be able to use different ways of treating a similar problem. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer your question perfectly, um, but I, I do think, again, there, there are many ways to address an issue and certainly being open to these is useful, but then of course questioning um, the data, the research, and of course the training behind it would be my other um, answer to it. And the fact that we live on the East Coast and not in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Although you could probably do telemedicine for that as well. You can <laughs> That's well, so, no, because it's physical tapping apparently. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, maybe right. need to so fly out to San Diego. That's a limitation. <laughs> yeah. 
Thanks, Anisha. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Um, I'm going to move into just probably one more question, and I have a, a couple follow-up questions, but I just want to be sensitive to everyone's time. Um, but any advice, uh, Anisha, you can give on co-parenting, how to navigate differences uh, there when dealing with teens? Um, Oh boy, um, I could talk a lot about that. My husband's not on the line right now. Um, and you know, being uh, co-parents is one level of issue and then um, throw on there, you know, having a, a, a spouse or a partner that has a different cultural background or has you know, grown up in a, a different place. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Indian American, but my husband is German. And um, we have sometimes very big differences in terms of how we view things, like take alcohol use, for example. Um, in Europe and in Germany, there's a lot more tolerance for kids, you know, drinking alcohol, drinking at, um, at the dinner table, and certainly, you know, drinking kind of earlier on. And I grew up in a family where that was really not approved, and it was definitely, you know, you're not drinking at all. So there's a lot of different values that we bring in um, uh, to our parenting styles. Um, and my short answer is that it's really important for us as parents to continue to keep having dialogues about these things um, and to think about these issues as we're working with our teenagers that are always testing us and figuring out really quickly who they're going to go to and kind of play off of each other. Um, trying to think about um, as parents in general, what are your brown boundaries and your framework? What we do know from research is that um, kids really do need framework and boundaries and rules. Those are actually really um, some ways very um, helpful, even though they're always going to test those rules and we as parents need to give them a little wiggle room sometimes to go beyond it. So again, I think my answer for co-parenting is where there's a lot of styles that are out there trying to make sure that we continue to have dialogues about differences. If you're having a lot of challenges, there's always this going on at home. This may be a good time for you to get someone else involved, whether it's a family member, a coach, or you know, a psychologist or a family therapist, because there are some families where it's really hard to make to resolve these issues. Oh, we can't hear you, Matt. <laughs> Sorry, I had the mute. We had, you know, with Zoom, I've got piano going on downstairs, <laughs> barking. Sorry. Um, kind of two last questions, Anisha, I, I kind of have for you and, and hopefully can share with the group yeah. is. What, do you, what are some of the things um, parents should impress upon their children and kind of, you know, trying to wear, raise that, that global teen, if you will, um, and kind of the teen that's going to be kind of that, that good citizen, if you will? Um, what, what are things that, that you recommend or what are some of your suggestions that you might have? I think this is such an important question, um, particularly now when there's so many things that we're struggling with right now in our society. Um, and I think Tower Hill does also a really good job in terms of ensuring that kids become global citizens. But at the end of the day, it's an important thing that we as parents um, need to be instilling um, at home. And um, I, I guess I have three very quick points. The first is that we need to encourage kids to have experiences. And I know my parents are on the line. I'll just put a shout out to my own parents that um, they really encouraged um, my sister and I at an early age to go out there and try different things. And travel was a very important part of our life experience. And I think it's probably also then led me to continue to be a global traveler and to you know, encourage my kids to do that. So whether it's when COVID improves, but study abroad, getting kids to go out into other places that are a little bit different and out of their comfort zone um, is really, really important in terms of becoming global citizens and understanding the world in a much bigger place. Um, the other thing that I think is so important is kindness and just going back to this kind of basic quality of um, making sure that we as parents are treating the people around us with kindness and generosity and compassion and modeling those behaviors. And I know Tower Hill does a lot with community service, but as global citizens, this is the time now that we need to think about how we can reach out um, to the people around us, but even to other communities that are really challenged or going through a hard time. There's a lot that kids can learn from those experiences in terms of volunteerism and kindness and, and being uh, and treating others as we would treat um, ourselves. So just some quick thoughts in terms of becoming global citizens. Sure, thank you. And, and, and one other question I think, this might be one that kind of might help you wrap, wrap it up a little bit, but what's kind of the one message or one theme or, or thing that you would want us um, as parents kind of leaving this meeting to kind of walk away with? Um, right. <laughs> 
Uh, um, you know, maybe I'll just use this as a point for all of you to just chat in something right now, but what is the one thing that you're taking away from this discussion? Because we've talked about a lot of things and we've answered a lot of questions. The intent of my book was really to start conversations between parents and kids on a lot of really important topics, knowing how important those conversations and connections are. So maybe you guys can all chat in or just think about what that one thing is that you're going to do differently as a result of this um, you know, discussion today, you know, what is it that you're going to take away with you? Um, but I think the message I would impart to you um, and to everyone on there is going back and starting to have those discussions, using that moment, not putting it off, um, and starting to, again, connect and, and think about these tougher issues. But go ahead, folks. I don't see anyone chatting about this. Um, but what are you going to take away from this? What is that one or two things that you're going to do a little bit differently or think about? I will be asking more about their friends, uh, saying only about 50% of what's on my mind. I'm going to be looking at my son directly, houseplants, that's a good one, um, 50%. Um, I'm not the only parent arguing with my child about the phone use, that's true. <laughs> um, be a tree. So some, some good things that are happening and some, some good suggestions here. Um, so look, it, we're, we're approaching the, the, the top of the hour, nine o'clock again. Um, just wanted to thank Anisha Abraham, class of 1986, for, for being with us this evening. Her book, again, Raising Global Teens, um, like I said, on Amazon. Um, it's, it's one of the, the best sellers that's out there right now. Um, I, so I highly encourage you to do that. I want to thank all of you this evening. This is probably the largest audience that we had. We'd reached, reached up to 56 people um, that were on this particular call. So thank you all for participating. I'm also going to do a shameless plug right now for, for Tower Hill Homecoming that's coming up <laughs> full style. Um, October, get me right, Melissa, 24th, correct? 23rd and 24th, 23rd, yes. 24th. With some class Zoom conversations happening on the 25th. So, right. so three days. The year of five and, and zero. Um, so if you're in those classes, please, please, please go to the Tower Hill alumni page. Um, there, there's some events that we're having. We're going to have Fessy will be giving an overview, uh, state, of, state of the school. Um, we will have uh, the, the president of Pixar. Um, we're going to be having a virtual conversation with them. He's an alumni of Tower Hill. Again, class gatherings will be there. There's a 5k virtual race that you can participate in from anywhere. So shameless plug, please come in and participate. But again, wanted to thank everybody for coming this evening. Thank you once again, Anisha, for sharing your thoughts. I think it's a great book. I'm, I'm only halfway through, honestly, but I think it's very good. Um, and I'd encourage everyone. Um, again, this will be recorded for anyone that, that came late or wants to kind of review a section. It's definitely out there. But again, wanted to thank everyone um, this evening for participating. It was great seeing you. Please be safe. And until we meet again, adios. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Anisha. Thanks, Anisha. Good to see you. <laughs> Bye, Tori. Yes, bye to class of 86. Great to see all my classmates, too. Yay! Yeah. Welcome back to the U.S. Hey, Anne. How are you? Hey, Anne. Hey, everybody. Sorry. Right. Hey, and thank you, Bessie. Anisha, all these 986ers are like, what? Huh? I know. Bye, Dave. Bye. bye. Zoom. We're all Zoom later. <laughs> I don't think have a class in. <laughs> you set it up, Dave, okay? <laughs> From California.